Hi, welcome to Macintosh Librarian. This year, 2024, marks the 40th year of the Macintosh. In celebration of the 40th anniversary, we're going to talk about the original Macintosh 128K from 1984. <laughs> I've gone undercover as a 128K Mac. It's like going back in time. Oh, that's where you wandered off to. So how are you feeling in that 128K? I know you're used to the more spacious SE30 with four megabytes of RAM. It's kind of, uh, cramped in here, memory-wise, that is. <laughs> I've gone undercover as an original Mac. <sighs> I think you need a little bit more RAM, Mackie. Let's go ahead and get you transferred back over to the SC30 so you can help us go over the history and the software of the original Macintosh from 1984. Ooh, that sounds fun! Ah, home sweet home. I'm glad you're settling back in there, Mackie. I didn't think you'd be too comfy in the older model. It's pretty crazy going back to your old home. It always seems so much smaller than you remember. What's even crazier, Mackie, is that it only took Apple five years between the original Macintosh and the Macintosh SC30 that you've been living in ever since. Wow, those Apple guys sure were busy. I've actually been reading about the original Macintosh design team in the excellent book Insanely Great by Stephen Levy. This book talks about the origin of the Macintosh computing platform. See the link in the description if you want to read it too. The story of the Macintosh starts back in 1979. A small team at Apple was working on an internal secret project called the Lisa. This was a new Motorola 68000-based computer designed to be a more powerful product than the Apple II and the business-focused Apple III. Just prior to the start of the Lisa project, Apple cut a deal with Xerox that let Apple engineers look, but not touch, the revolutionary new computer concept called the Graphical User Interface, or the GUI as it's called today. Xerox called their new computer the Xerox Alto, and the interface was called Smalltalk. Eight Apple folks, including Steve Jobs and Bill Atkinson, were given a demonstration at Xerox Park. The Xerox demo included a desktop concept that we're all familiar with today, with multiple windows, easy to read icons, and editable text that can be manipulated with the mouse. All Apple had to do to get this momentous meeting was offer Xerox the chance to purchase 100,000 shares of Apple computers for a million dollars a year before Apple's initial IPO. Ah! That's a whole lot of money just to look at a screen. It sure was, Mackie. But you have to remember how new the entire idea of a graphical user interface was. This was the very first time in computing history where the user didn't have to type in lines of text into the computer to start a program or run a script. Wow! It must have been like looking into a magic screen to see the future of computing. And look at all those graphics, all the way back in the 1970s. It was so advanced for the time that Steve and his team went back to the Banley Drive headquarters in Cupertino and immediately went to work implementing the desktop and GUI concept for the Lisa project. And just to give everyone a lightning quick history of the Lisa, it was an ambitious project that never materialized into a commercial success for Apple. Weighed down by the high cost to produce, the Lisa wasn't exactly flying off the store's shelves when those costs were passed down to the consumer. While the Lisa was not commercially successful, it served as a crucial stepping stone for the future of Apple and their next ambitious project, the Apple Macintosh. Hey, that's me! Users were no longer greeted by an intimidating green blinking cursor and a blank screen. Instead, a user was greeted with a happy Macintosh icon and a mouse to point and click icons on Apple's new desktop GUI. The Macintosh, like the Lisa and the Xerox Alto before it, made it possible for users to interact with their digital desktops in a friendly and engaging way. Friendly and engaging, that sounds like me again. The Macintosh basically introduced the mouse to everyone too. You're absolutely right, Mackie. The Macintosh was introduced to the public in an unforgettable Steve Jobsian way in a completely over-the-top, grandiose television advertisement directed by the man who brought aliens to the big screen, Sir Ridley Scott. In order to make sure that most people saw the ad, Steve Jobs paid an enormous amount of money to show the advertisement for the first time during the 1984 Superb Owl. And you'll see why I remember that ad! It was so cool! It had this lady that threw a big hammer at a TV screen? Kind of a bummer for that screen, though. It would have been pretty cool to play some video games on it. Apple wanted to make a statement with their product, and they wanted to show that the Macintosh was a computer for ordinary people instead of something that stayed in the office. Remember, 
Apple was a growing upstart company at the time who was competing against the monolithic conglomerate of IBM. <gasps> IBM! Steve Jobs walked onto stage in January 1984 and introduced his new product to the world. Before showing the device to his audience, he listed off a few of its key features, including one of the first home machines to use the new Sony 3.5 inch floppy drive. After the introduction, he walked over across the stage to a duffel bag and pulled out the Macintosh. People were in awe of its size. The power of Elisa, a full GUI, and a powerful Motorola 68000 processor, and a screen in an all-in-one compact computer. The IBM PC was a massive behemoth compared to the easy-to-carry Mac that Steve Jobs pulled out of his bag. The crowd grew silent as an impressive Macintosh demo played out on the big screen. Mac Paint, Mac Write, and a host of other programs showed how this little computer was for more than just crunching numbers. In Steve's mind, the Macintosh was for making art, just as it was for making spreadsheets. The crowd went wild. It was truly the computer for the rest of us. And it was so cool when the Mac started to talk on stage. We'd like to let uh, Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. Glad to be out of this bag. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> the moment that the Mac, as it became known, spoke to the audience has gone down in history as the first time Apple showed the world that this computer was much more than just a dull appliance. It was a friend. It was an assistant. It was ready to help you create, learn, and play. Us Macs sure did go on to do some amazing things. People started to think of us as something that every house needs. Parents could read the news, do their taxes, or other boring stuff on a Mac, and then kids had a bunch of stuff they could do on a Mac too. We could help kids write reports, or do math homework, or even help them read better. Oh, and of course, entertainment became a huge part of computers, too. To really understand how the Macintosh changed the game, we need to see it in action. So let's go ahead and load up the original Macintosh OS, System 1. Since we don't have any 400k floppy disks, we'll have to use the floppy emulator instead. This little device will allow us to emulate a floppy disk on the Mac and allow us to use downloadable images to a little micro SD card. So all we have to do is connect the floppy emu to the floppy expansion port on the back of the Mac. Oh, wow, it's my old neighborhood. Ah, I forgot how simple things were back then. Just like in 1984, we need to demonstrate the amazing Mac Paint. While fairly primitive by today's standards, Mac Paint was a revolutionary tool that allowed anyone to create works of art with just a mouse and a few clicks. Created by Bill Atkinson, one of the main developers of the Macintosh GUI and the QuickDraw system that powered it, Mac Paint was a perfect way to demonstrate the graphical capabilities of the Macintosh. Mac Paint gives the user access to multiple paintbrushes and tools to draw your pixel-perfect masterpiece. Drawing tools at the time were not nearly as sophisticated as Mac Paint was. Mac Paint gave users the ability to create custom brushes, multiple shape types, and even different colors or patterns that were pre-made. All the tools that you see here on the side were revolutionary. The select tool allowed the user to grab a portion of the image, copy it, flip it, or rotate it, or even trace it. The lasso tool used the fill algorithm to detect the boundaries of what you're selecting, allowing for a pixel perfect selection along the perimeter of your image. All these changes happened as a 128K Macintosh updated the screen and kept the image in view without major flickering. The computer was able to show real-time changes to the image thanks to the Motorola 68K processor and an ingenious trick in the programming that was made by Bill Atkinson. The Mac stored multiple image buffers off screen, allowing one buffer to be what the user saw and the other buffers were used for storing previous states of the screen. Hmm, a buffer? Stored a previous state of the screen? That sounds an awful lot like an undo function. That's right, Mackie. The system of buffers is still used today in everything from image software to word processing. If the user makes a mistake, a simple command Z can swoop back the project to the previous state. Wow, Mac Paint really did introduce a lot of neat features. It really did, Mackie. You can easily see how Mac Paint's features and GUI helped inspire software like Photoshop and even Microsoft's own MS Paint. Before the GUI became popular in the Macintosh and the Lisa before it, computer users were limited on what they could do based on their memory of cryptic commands. 
someone might be an expert at loading games on the Apple II using load or bload for binary load. Or maybe they could write a few lines of basic, but the Macintosh removed the need to know any computer commands. In fact, the Macintosh didn't even ship with BASIC, or a terminal, something that critics called a major flaw in Apple's system design. Previous computer users had grown accustomed to using a terminal and BASIC commands, and the idea of getting rid of text commands in favor of double-clicking was very foreign to them. However, the mouse, in combination with the GUI, were able to unlock an entirely new segment of computer users who would have been put off by endless text strings and the need to look up BASIC commands in a dictionary. The Macintosh GUI allowed the user to be in charge of the computer instead of the other way around. A computer user could now fully utilize the software of their computer without needing to know the magical incantations. Instead, all they had to do was find the right icon on the desktop or find the right menu item for the toolbar. Okay, I think we've gone over Mac Paint enough. Let's move over to Mac Write. Mac Write was one of Apple's first word processors that utilized the GUI. And it was based on the what you see is what you get or WYSIWYG concept. Just like in Mac Paint, the computer was able to store buffers as a document being written by the user. This allowed for changes in the document to be reversible, but it also had other functions, like being able to set images in the document as well as text. Aw, oh, that's pretty neat. Could a user have both Mac Paint and Mac Write open at the same time? That's sort of what we do today, right? Unfortunately, the original Mac could only run one program at a time. The concept of a computer running multiple programs at once is so ubiquitous today, but back then, the concept of multitasking hadn't really taken hold, mainly due to hardware limitations. However, in an effort to bring some limited multitasking functionality, Apple developed desk accessories, which were small applications that could run alongside other software. The user could find these by simply clicking on the small Apple logo at the top corner. These are all applications that could run on top of a previously opened application. Let's copy an image from Mac Paint and copy it into Mac Write. Since the Macintosh doesn't have enough memory to handle both Mac Write and Mac Paint, we can use an intermediary application, the Scrapbook. The Scrapbook is an accessory application that stores the clipboard contents onto disk instead of using the system RAM. It's a rabbit. This allows the user to reuse content across different applications without slowing the computer down to a crawl. The functionality of the scrapbook evolved with the subsequent releases of Mac OS and was still shipped in the operating systems up to Mac OS 9. Hey, weren't we supposed to be talking about Mac, right? You're right, Mackie. Let's go over how the WYSIWYG methodology worked inside Mac, right? Here I have an example flyer that I'll be posting to Patreon. I can change the font, set the page layout, and move things around in real time. And when I go to print my flyer out, it'll look exactly the same as it did on my screen. WYSIWYG! Now there's no more guessing about what the final document will look like before you print it. Exactly, Mackie. With MacWrite, users could create documents with ease. Also, with the Awesome Possum scrapbook, we're able to copy an image that we saved in Mac Paint and insert it into our document for MacWrite. Now we can continue making our Patreon announcement. This one's about the release of Mackie, Tui, and Jesse figures. Ooh, those are some cool figures. Wasn't Microsoft Word release a year before MacWrite? Did Apple steal Microsoft's ideas? The concept of typesetting and writing out documents actually goes back to the printing press and the typewriter. However, the concept of a WYSIWYG editor was always being pursued by office machine companies like IBM, Wang, Motorola, and Xerox. Back in the early 80s, offices were starting to use IBM PCs and the Wang word processors. These were most definitely not WYSIWYG, relying on large blocky fonts rendered in DOS or a similar interface. These older text editors also didn't have mouse input, which meant that you couldn't intuitively highlight text, drag and drop, and move images around the screen. As a matter of fact, Microsoft Word with its familiar GUI and layout was a Macintosh product first. Starting in 1983, Microsoft Word was native to the DOS operating system, but it lacked any kind of GUI, and it was more similar to the older text editors before MacWrite. In 1985, however, Microsoft developed the first GUI-based version of Word for the Macintosh. The joint effort between Apple and Microsoft actually led Microsoft to develop Windows 1.0 as a GUI-based operating system, ostensibly to compete with Apple. 
I also wanted to talk a little bit about the person primarily responsible for the look and feel of those first programs, Susan Kerr. Kerr is an amazing artist and graphic designer who helped develop a lot of the Mac icons, including the famous Happy Mac. Most people know and love the Happy Mac from when he greets us at boot. She designed all the icons in Mac Paint and Mac Word that let the user know at a glance exactly what button did what. As any modern web developer can tell you, making a sleek and intuitive user interface is a lot harder than you think. Care and her team were faced with one of the biggest challenges of all, how to do it for the very first time. Hmm, she sounds like a pretty important lady. Maybe we should do a whole episode about her sometime. That sounds like a great idea, Mackie. The engineers at Apple are the true magic makers. Steve Jobs does take a lot of the credit. But the ideas, work, and the creative programming, and the passion of building remarkable Apple products all comes from the amazing Apple engineers who pour their heart and souls into their product, sometimes for years at a time. I think the original Macintosh team deserves its own episode. Each one of them contributed to a major component of the Macintosh and Apple computers. And this video would be over an hour if I went through all the contributions here. It amazes me to see how big a risk they took on the Macintosh but it paid off for the company in the long run. Even our modern Mac OS still has the same basic user interface elements, such as a top menu bar, the Apple icon on the left, and the desktop interface. As we celebrate 40 years of the Macintosh, we look forward to seeing how Apple will continue the Macintosh spirit and how Mac's legacy will inspire future generations. Hopefully there'll be even bigger and better things to come. I hope so, Mackie. And thanks for everyone for joining us in this exploration of the original Macintosh. The Macintosh holds a very special place in my heart as one of the first computers I ever used, and the computer that made me love technology. Aw, I feel so special! Ooh, and don't forget, Macintosh Librarian is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks to all our awesome Patreon supporters, and check out the link below if you want to join the Macintosh Librarian fan club. Bye everyone, see you next time. Bye!